Okay, so anyway, um, let's get started. Let's see if I should record. All right, let's record too. So we're going to look at a stock called Biomarin. This is a company I know really well. Um, long history with these guys, but we'll start sort of fresh and talk about the way I would uh, look at it. As I sometimes mention, I have these sort of six variables that I always kind of try to keep track of. Um, the stock price, the shares outstanding. So where do you get shares outstanding? I'm going to go to the SEC's website. Um, go to company filings, type in the stock ticker. There we go. And I'm going to look at the latest 10Q. And right around the first page, this is a document that every company has to file with the Securities and Exchange Commission. It's called a Form 10-Q. Um, it's three quarters in the year. In the fourth quarter, they file something called a Form 10-K. So this is the second quarter. It tells you the address of the company in case you want to be an angry shareholder and show up for the phone number. Um, and uh, here's an amount of shares outstanding. So that's the amount of shares of the company. Basically, the company is divided into equal shares. So your share of the company, if you bought one share, would be which would cost $90 right now, would be one one eight one one hundred eighty five millionth so you wouldn't have much of a share but you'd have your share and that's what matters so maybe you'd have a thousand shares if you had a thousand shares how much would you own well you would own one over one hundred eighty five thousand four hundred seventy thirds of the company if you had a million shares you would own a little less than one percent of the company maybe half of one percent of the company one one eighty fifth but it would cost you ninety million dollars to buy a million shares so uh, difficult to do. So anyway, if you bought every share, it would cost you 16 or 17 billion dollars, which is the market cap of the company or market capitalization. And let that sink in a little bit. $90 a share, 185 million shares. So you can imagine a big pizza pie that's uh, divided into 185 million parts. Um, you know, I wonder if Google has like, show me what 185 million looks like. I wonder if you could show me like a... Um, like a uh, amount of uh, like bricks on a wall or something, you know what I mean? Um, apparently, Drake has a uh, uh, a plane that costs one hundred eighty-five million dollars. But um, let's see, one hundred eighty-five million cubes. Maybe like Wolfram Alpha has something. Uh, Wolfram Alpha, one hundred eighty-five million. Pretty cool. It's got some some tools here. Graph. Let's see. Cube root. <laughs> that spelling was funny. This is weird. It doesn't even tell me the cube root if I put it backwards. Okay, it's five hundred and seventy roughly. So 570 cubed graph. Hmm. Well, we're having a tough time visualizing what 185 million looks like, but if you had 185 million, it would be 570 sided or sort of unit cube, I guess. But uh, yeah, I'm having a tough time. Uh, generating this, but maybe one of you guys knows how to use Wolfram Alpha better than I do. <laughs> anyway, it's a $17 billion company. So that's the key. It's about 90 bucks a share, 185 million shares. Let's look to see if they have any cash. So the, so the cash is listed on something called a balance sheet, which is one of the three important financial statements. So it looks like they have around a billion dollars of cash, maybe a little more. So I'm going to add it up. 619 million there. Marketable securities and short-term investments, cash and cash equivalents. That's all cash to me, at least. Um, cash doesn't have to be cash in a bank account. It could be t treasury bonds and stuff like that. Because um, if you don't need that cash, you might as well get some treasury bonds to grow. All right, so they have 1.5 billion in cash. And over time, you get used to reading these lines quickly. Um, debt, it looks like they have a billion dollars of debt that's convertible debt, which is a little bit different than normal debt. 
It'll, we'll count it like that just the same. And so the enterprise value is 16.3 uh, 16 billion, point, 16 .3 billion, which is pretty similar to the market cap. So enterprise value is market cap minus cash plus debt. So it's basically kind of trying to neutralize the, the, the balance sheet, take the net cash, which is 500 million and subtract it from the market cap. So you kind of know what part the business is worth versus what part the company is worth. So that's pretty simple. Biomarin is a drug company. Um, so we're just going to list the, the assets they have real quick. And we can do that by actually just going to the website if we wanted to. I just click our treatments and they have a list of them here. Um, there's a lot of ways to do this, but I think this isn't a bad way for a smaller company. So let's see. They've got uh, a bunch of interesting ones. Some of these are new, um, like Vox, uh, Vox Zogo is new. Viseratide. I've been following this drug for like more than 10 years. Um, I remember when they just invented it. Uh, Palinzic, which is used to be called PegPal back in the day. Renura, which is also pretty new. Limizen, little sulfase. Kuvan, which is I think generic now. And it used to be their biggest drug, Nagelzyme. I think they have a couple more. So Biomarin has expanded from a company with just one or two drugs to quite a few. They have one more drug. I think that I'm just going to leave. So I'm going to leave one spot blank here because I think they have one more drug. Isn't the Lems drug? Um, doesn't that count? What was that drug called? They partnered with Catalyst. They only have the rest of World Rights, I think. But anyway. We'll see if I, my memory serves me correctly. So that's the drugs that they're selling right now. And we're just going to put indication, which is what disease they're for. Um, and again, we can we can look at that pretty quickly here. This is for achondroplasia, which is a form of dwarfism. Um, pal, palinzic, which is for uh, PKU. Kuvan's also for PKU, so I'll just drop that in there real quick. Um, Brunora, which is for Batten disease. Vimizem, which is for mucopolysaccharidosis, or MPS. This is MPS uh, 4A. Okay, Naglazyme, which is also for MPS, but a different MPS, which is a different disease. That's MPS 6. And then Aldurazyme, which is also for MPS, but it's for MPS 1. So MPS is a really um, tough uh, liposomal storage diseases. All right, so we've got all the indications. I guess we can put down when they were approved. So we can get that from drugs at FDA, which is a really nice um, FDA website. All right, so I'm just going to type in each drug real quick, and get the approval date. Voxogo, as I mentioned, is a new drug. Um, it was approved 11-19-2021. Oops. All right, Palinzic is relatively new, but not as new as Vox Zogo. All right, 2018. Brunura is also relatively new. It's funny how Biomarin has had excellent execution in their uh, products. Everything they've sort of developed has gotten approval with a few rare exceptions. So when they really invest in a program, they, they tend to get approval. All right, Vimizim came out. I think I got these in order of, I may have these in order of approval. Let's see. And you can see they've kind of come out with a new product every every year or so, every other year, basically, which is pretty, pretty impressive for what was originally a very small biotech company. All right, got to be careful to get the right NDA here. I think the tablet came out first for Kuvan. Pretty sure it did. Let's see if that is right. FDA website's maybe not the fastest site in the world. All right, approval 2007. Ooh, Naglazyme. Mm, I still think it's a close call. It might be Kuvan. Yeah, I think Kuvan came after Naglazyme. Let's see. 
Somebody should make a bio similar to Naglesheim, but that's a whole other story for another day. All right, Naglesheim was 2005. All right, so far I got them right. Although the website, you know, the website might have listed them in order, so I'm not going to take credit. <laughs> All right, and Aldurazyme is Genzyme's drug, which we'll list in a second. Maybe we'll list that here, Economics. That's Sanofi, now that Sanofi bought Genzyme a while back. All right, so I think the website did list it in order. All right, Kuvan was weird, because Kuvan was from Merck KGAA, or whatever they say in Germany. Vimizim, I'm pretty sure, is 100% theirs. These two are 100% theirs. Again, I'm pretty sure I could be wrong here. We'll, we'll look at that later. Okay. Sometimes I like to write the form of administration. Almost all of these are intravenous, but I know Kuban's oral um, intellectual property is something we'll work on in a minute. So now we've got kind of this grid set up of all the FDA approved drugs that they sell. I think they sell a couple more, as I mentioned, but regardless. Um, we're going to go to their pipeline, which for a drug company is pretty important. And so the biggest pipeline drug they have by far is called Valrox or Valoctogene uh, Roxa Parvovec, which is obviously the naming for kind of a FDA, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, the, the USAN name for a, a AAV. And the indication here is hemophilia A. And this is a much talked about drug. And I'm pretty sure they have 100% rights there. Um, let's center this thing. And I'll right adjust this thing. All right. And this is, uh, oh, you know what? I need one more thing for mechanism of action. And so this is enzyme replacement therapy, enzyme replacement therapy, enzyme replacement therapy. This is AAB for factor eight. Um, all right, so what else do we have here? We have BMN331. So they have a pretty bare pipeline. Um, it's safe to say, but that's partially because they've done really well. So I wouldn't say it's a good or a bad thing. They just have done really well with their pipeline. Other than the odyssey of this uh, hemophilia cure that they've been developing, which we'll talk about in a minute. All right, so they got a couple of gene therapies here. Um, BMN 349, which is alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, all right, what else do they have? DM, uh, DMD drug. BMN 351 for DMD. And BMN 293, also known as DINA 001 for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which we could just abbreviate as HCM. All right, so pretty skinny pipeline, and a lot of it is not even in the clinic. So just this guy in phase one, and of course, uh, Valrox, which is uh, quite the odyssey. Um, so where do we go from here? We've got all the assets of the company listed in this page. And at the end of the day, the value of the company is the sum of all these assets, right? You could hypothetically add up these seven FDA-approved drugs and these seven um, investigational drugs, and you could probably get a good value for what the company is worth. You could do that separately or individually, and we're going to sort of take, um, I don't know, I guess a hybrid approach, but regardless, that's sort of the, the method to the madness here. Um, and we'll talk about the benefits and shortcomings of that, that method, but we'll start by just looking at the business itself. So we looked at the balance sheet really briefly, but the rest of the business is the story is better told in this kind of tab tabular format, which some people call model. Um, and uh, we're going to go through, uh, make a quick model for Biomarin. All right, so let's go to, we have the 10Q open, so maybe we'll do that real quick. So you can see they had half a billion in revenues for Q2 22. That was more than last year by a marginal amount. Um, and so this is the kind of thing we're going to try to forecast, but um, actually, yeah, let's do it. Let's start with this. So I'm just going to sort of copy and paste. And again, every Wall Street analyst uh, who has ever worked on Wall Street knows exactly what I'm doing right now. It's the tedious process of going through all the financial statements of the company. That is something you cannot avoid. Um, you got to learn to sort of take pleasure in it. And we'll modify this model a little bit. And the reason we do these by hand, or we do these 
by ourselves is uh, each one of us has our own opinion on the way what we should include or not include and there's no real way to do this um, in a different way from the way I'm showing you. Um, trust me, we've, as an industry, hundreds of thousands of people in Wall Street, we've all tried. And I've noticed that people actually in Wall Street have taken my method and that I started, um, I've hand taught it to probably 50 or so people that have worked for me over the years, maybe 100 that have worked specifically for me in financial analysis. And um, it's been exported to thousands of people. So I've seen other companies and other hedge funds models and they've used the exact um, system that I've used. So it's sort of become a weird little standard, which is fun to see. Um, so anyway, I know a lot of people have done interviews with top hedge funds and um, my models have uh, passed muster at private equity companies, hedge funds, anywhere really. So I have a very good uh, sense for how to do these. Um, I've taken uh, a lot of my what I've learned from some of the people I've worked with over the years, added a little bit of my own remixes, but it's not like all mine or anything like that. Different people added and subtracted. Even some of you guys have helped me add and subtract a little to the process. So anyway, we're just um, formulaically doing this. So uh, anytime you have an input, um, you put it as an input. Some people color inputs uh, as black and formulas as blue. I don't do that. Um, it's not a bad idea, but the, form the formulas are things like operating expenses or the combination of R&D and sg &A, operating profits, the gross profit minus operating expenses, etc. If you're not familiar with the income statement, then um, you might get a little lost in this video, but um, the income statement is basically the operating performance of the company. How much did they sell? What costs do they have? How much did it cost? And what profit was left over? So you can see Biomarin had 44 million of profit left over after 534 million of drug sales. The cost to make those drugs was around 100 million, so they got to keep 40 cents on the dollar. And I, I actually saw an article today about Pfizer and their markup of their COVID vaccine. And it's really funny because, like, you can see. It only costs a com drug company a small amount of money to make a product, but what about this stuff? Right, you can see BioMarin barely makes any money after all their costs. So it's pretty, uh, you know, disingenuous uh, is the word maybe, uh, to just look at the materials cost. A lot goes into these products, uh, not just the materials cost. And BioMarin, I mean, the Pfizer in their case, they have to split um, the profit with uh, BioNTech. So, you know, Pfizer uh, didn't have a higher price. I'm not sure they make any money on that vaccine. So it's really, and the volume is about to drop like a rock and the government's probably going to stop paying for it. So you have a lot of reasons if you're Pfizer to raise the price. Um, and I hope they don't get any treatment that I got, let's say that, for raising the price. Or maybe, uh, again, I'm not bitter about it or anything, but, uh, you know, I hope they, they get treated better because they're a great company in my opinion. Um, anyway, let's uh, keep going here. So we have one quarter here from Q2 and we have last year's quarter. And the nice thing about these models is you only have to set this up once. So once you've set this up, and I my, I just checked my Biomarin model from before jail and it's really old, so I thought I'd just start a new one. So once you set these up, you, can, you only have to plug in one quarter at a time, which is really good because you'll have all the old data already built up. So they grew revenue by 6% year over year. The gross margin, which is the ratio of, of kind of gross profit, which is basically sales after material costs, 77%, so pretty high, normal kind of drug gross margin. It's a little actually lower than normal, actually, because Biomarin makes all their own products, and they, um, they're all biologics, so they're very tough to make from a, a bio, biotechnology perspective, because they use different uh, living organisms to make these uh, uh, drugs. So anyway, let's keep going here. And what I'm looking for is a list of the, the product sales. So that's kind of the more, most important thing for a, any drug company, really. Um, so we got Vimizim, which is their biggest product. It's almost a so-called blockbuster product. Uh, you can see its sales maybe have slowed down a little bit. Uh, revenue is about the same as last year for this quarter, but in rare disease drugs, it can be a little misleading for one quarter because they tend to skip around. Um, I think Naglazyme, their second biggest drug, which for a while is their biggest drug. Um, Naglazyme was... Uh, uh, has sort of reached its peak, as you can see, I think. But again, one quarter, it can be very uh, misleading. PegPal, or Pal Palinzic, I'm always going to call it PegPal because that's what they called it for forever. 
uh, Palinzik, or Palinzik, 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 we'll see how they pronounce it in a minute, is there. Kuvan went generic, but it's still kind of holding on to its own, so it hasn't like fully dropped off a rock yet. You can see it's dropped because of cheaper entrance, but it hasn't dropped completely off a rock, uh, off the cliff. Um, and look at that, uh, Vox Zogo, which is a relatively new drug, is already doing pretty pretty well, actually. For a rare disease drug, that's, that's a pretty solid start. Um, so these are all rare disease drugs. That's what Biomarin specializes in. These are drugs for people who are very, very sick, who uh, may die without their drug, and these drugs cost a lot. They're several hundred thousand dollars a year. Um, so that's uh, pretty normal for rare disease drugs. Uh, again, not bitter, but you know, kind of what I used to price Daraprim, since it's also a rare disease drug. But you know, what can you do? Um, all right, so these are the product sales, and it matches. So when you copy and paste a um, formula, you can sort of get a sense for how that works. One of the, um, I think their most expensive drug is Naglazyme. It's around $600,000 a year. Um, so you have the geographic um, sales as well, which are not that important, but you can sort of see that the U.S. is their biggest territory, but it's unlike most drug companies, it's not their only territory, or it's not like the majority of sales. It's just one country out of very many for them. And you can see that Europe is as big as U.S., which is un uncommon. Latin America, which is usually a footnote, is really big for them. Almost half the size of the U.S., or roughly half the size of the U.S. And the rest of the world is, is another pretty big uh, category. So they had Russia and China, and my guess is the rest of the world is down probably a little bit because of Russia, but I, I don't know if Bioman stopped selling in Russia. That would be really cruel. So I doubt they stopped selling in Russia, but there could be some timing of payments issues there. We'll see. Anyway, that's really it um, for that quarter. So we're just going to go and find another quarter, which is Q1. This time I'm going to go to the company's um, website. And I'm going to check for press releases, which is kind of the official communications of the company. It's the most important thing you can read as an investor. Some people ask, where do I start with investing? You just read all the company's press releases. That's typically a pretty good idea. So they're going to report Q3 in just two days. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, but I want to look at the past. So I'm going to look at Q1. Um, let's take a look at Q1. So here's the products by revenue. You can see Vimizim is 183, Maclesime was 128, Kuvan came in at 59.3, Pal uh, came in at 54.9, Brunura was 36.2, interesting. Um, and then the new Voxogo was 19.7, okay. And then Aldurazyme, which is, like I mentioned, Sanofi's drug, really there. And I'll take last year's numbers. Vimism grew quite a bit over last year there. So did Naglazyme. Uh, Pal seems to have flattened. Uh, Kuvan again went generic, so it's sort of dropping a little. Um, Brunura, decent growth there. Still kind of seems to be... These growth curves are really weird. There's nothing like rare diseases in pharma. Uh, they can be quite, quite unusual growth curves. Anyway, that's that. The CEO, uh, JJ, bien ami, or good friend in English. Uh, Jean-Jacques, he's been the CEO of Biomarin for a long time. He's uh, really kind of transformed the company. Um, who knows how long he'll be there. Um, maybe getting close to a retirement point. He's done really well. Created a really big company. Some people don't love JJ, but uh, regardless, I think did a pretty good job. Um, let's see. All right, so you can see this is sort of pretty streamlined once you get used to the formatting and all that. Like you can plug and chug, as they say, on Wall Street really quickly. So it doesn't take much at all to fill out one of these 
And if you get really good at it, you kind of look at as much as a company a day. And I mean in, in, in some depth, uh, if you're really efficient. A company a day is pretty fast if you ask me because there's so much to look at, but um, you can at least get a, a cursory view. Um, so yeah, this, this is sort of weird because you're including the convertible, but I'm gonna leave that shares thing alone for a minute. All right, so you can see revenue growth uh, positive for two quarters in a row. Definitely not a bad thing. Um, you know, six, 7% grower of the base business, and then we'll see kind of what they can do with the, um, the pipeline. All right, so here's fourth quarter results, which again, we're getting pretty close to having all the results. Um, so we're moving really fast now. 156.3, uh, that goes on 83.1. That's weird. Look at that really lumpy um, quarter for, for naglozyme. Those things happen with rare diseases, as I mentioned, especially for naglozyme because a lot of the patients are in Latin America, I believe. So sometimes they'll order a bunch of drugs, sometimes they won't, and the company doesn't have the smooth revenue that a lot of other companies do. Um, and that's okay. We as investors understand that. All right, so again, look at the first three quarters of Voxogo, pretty darn good. I mean, this has potential to, to, to become one of their bigger drugs, I think. So the base business could be growing even faster than maybe what we've been seeing. All right. Um, looks good, looks good. Got all that right? All right, I think so. The, one of the troubles with Biomarin is they haven't been profitable. Uh, I don't think that's been such a bad thing. They really haven't been profitable basically forever. And they could be profitable, but you can see they spend quite a lot on their organization. You can see, I don't know, something like almost a billion dollars a year on their business, which um, without things like uh, more than a billion, about a billion and a half on their organization, that's without including their cost of goods. So they're really kind of a big enterprise from a footprint perspective. And that's not a bad thing because, I mean, ultimately, if your company's going to scale, Wall Street understands that. People, like, for example, one of the criticisms for Amazon was, oh, these guys aren't any aren't profitable. Why not? You know, why aren't they, why don't they have profits? And I think that was an old way of looking at business um, that um, was pretty short-sighted by Wall Street and by others. And people who could find a way to ignore, well, is the company actually currently profitable or make, are they making the deliberate choice to be unprofitable? And I think those are two really different things, right? Anybody could go into Biomarin tomorrow and make it a profitable company. And I actually thought about doing that years ago, but that's another story lost in the annals of Wall Street. But um, the, um, the point is that, uh, you know, this is a company that could easily be profitable. For example, this quarter, they lost uh, 41 million, but if you chop the R&D, you don't even have to chop all of it. They would be up, they'd make over 100 million. So, of course, you want to do some R&D to potentially grow the company's revenue even more. And eventually, you'll scale in a good way. Look at Vertex uh, as a good example of that, uh, VRTX. So anyway, we're almost done here, one more quarter, and we should be ready to take a break. Mm -hmm. do, 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 do. And I'm recording this video for future upload. Um, so subscribe to the channel, and do all that good stuff. I, I need these YouTube checks. I'm just kidding, I, I don't need YouTube checks, but they're still fun to get. Um, so um, just plugging in a couple more numbers and we'll be done. Again, big lumpiness for Vimism, another rare disease drug that's just I mean, again, the net amount of people on Vimism is probably less than a thousand people. So you think about like what is a rare disease drug? You know, people really don't understand the scope of you know millions of people take SSRIs, hundreds of thousands of people take some cancer medicines, maybe tens of thousands, but only a, a couple hundred people take naclozyme, right? I mean, it's an amazing thing. I once sold a drug for sixty people, um, and it's important for pharma to to have a way to to take care of those 60 people, because those could be your, your brother, your sister, could be you. I know we have like a bunch of people in my community who have rare diseases, and you know, um, 
sometimes there's nowhere to turn if you have a really rare disease. And companies like Biomarin, I think, do really amazing stuff for their patients. And if you know the people that work at a company like that or the companies I've started, they're really passionate about helping those people that are really kind of forsaken and abandoned by most of the drug industry. So Biomarin is a really cool company. Um, and again, if you are, it, it may sound cruel to, or weird to like hear about aldurazyme or Vimazim or Naglazyme at $600,000 may sound like, wow, what are these guys doing? That sounds like so much money. But the reality is if you have that illness, if you're dying of mucopolysaccharidosis six, and you've never, there's never been a drug for that disease. And there was never going to be a drug for that disease with about biomarin. I'd be getting a biomarin tattoo. I don't know about you. I'd be pretty, pretty pumped up that, that this company saved my life. Um, and you know, the, the companies in business uh, make money, sure. But, um, if you know how their insurance system works, they're always, uh, uh, insured for these rare diseases because the insurance company doesn't see any need to, uh, say no, their insurance company is now called managed care. It used to be health insurance, but there's sort of been a sly rebranding to managed care, which is kind of a, its own thing I'll discuss some other day, but the uh, point is that their job is to manage care and they manage care by saying, oh, well, you shouldn't be on this expensive uh, insulin when you should be on generic metformin. Well, that's a good decision. That's how they manage the care. But for this, if you have mucopolysaccharidosis 6, there's nothing to manage. You have to be on this drug and that's why they uniformly pay for it. And it's interesting in Brazil, you have a constitutional right to access health care, including expensive drugs. So that's why a lot of their patients happen to be in Brazil, because while it's not a very rich country, it's a very big country. So um, many patients are able to access uh, biomarins medicine. As you can see, they sell hundreds of millions of dollars of this stuff, so people can get it. Um, so I would always laugh when people would say, well, well you price Steriprim so high, nobody can get uh, the product. I said, well, and who are we selling it to? <laughs> Why? How are we getting? How are we getting all this revenue if nobody can get it? Who's paying for it? It doesn't make any sense, right? It's a bit of a paradox. Uh, but again, you know, you can't expect reason from just about everybody. Um, but some some people are can reason. Um, so anyway, let's do the annual. So we have um, a bunch of quarters here. We don't have too much, but um, I'll kind of go a little bit quickly. We're gonna do some forecasts. So how do we do forecasts? That's really hard, the hardest part about all of this, isn't it? Uh, you know, the, the, the past sales anybody could do. You guys saw how me do it in what, 10 minutes? That's pretty easy. And it maybe looked complicated or looked like I was doing it really fast, but at the end of the day, anybody can learn to do that. Um, it's no different from playing a video game or riding a bicycle or whatever. The brain comes in now, right? Now we have to ask ourselves really hard questions what the heck is gonna to happen to the future? The past we know, the past we can look at these and see, but what the heck is gonna to happen tomorrow? And so the company gives guidance, so that doesn't hurt, but the guidance is only for um, uh, one year. So they, they kind of have a sense for what's gonna happen, but they even the company doesn't really know. Isn't that funny? The company is not always right about that. Well, let's look at this royalty line. It looks like this royalty line's the same every damn quarter, right? It averages about 15 a quarter. So you know what, I'm gonna forecast, I'm gonna take the bold step of saying, I think it's gonna be 15 again. All right, so we got 15 down, we got still what, um, seven more assets to go. So which other ones look like they're really stable? Well, let's look at Naglazine. Naglazine has been 103 on average for a while, and we can even do like a moving average of four quarters. Um, let's try that. So we're gonna do moving average of four quarters, and we can see that that doesn't move very much. It stays on average around 100. So would it make sense for us to do 100? I don't see why not. Um, Vimism is different. Vimism is kind of growing. So let's see what happens if we do the moving average there. Well, you can see it seems to be kind of growing. Um, first it was 150, then it kind of moved up to 160. Maybe 165 is a healthy moving average for Vimism. Um, we'll try that. Uh, PAL, Polinzic, well, this one looks like it's going up around one every quarter, so I'm just gonna do that. And the quarterly uh, forecasts are not nearly as important as the annual forecast. When we get to the annual forecast, that's gonna be really big. Well, Kuvan went generic, so Kuvan looks like it's dropping one or two every quarter, maybe even as much as three quarters, so let's drop it by three. Um, Brunner is a new drug, but mm, kinda looks like it's topped out a bit. Um, maybe let's just add one per quarter. 
Now this is the wild card. Voxogo, well they're saying it's going to be 130 to 160. So let's see. If they do 40 and 60, that would be 150, which is right around what they're telling us it's going to be. Um, let's see how we did with Bernura. Um, Bernura, they say 145 to 160. We got it right in the middle at 150. Okay, what else? Uh, for Kuvan, they're saying 210 to 235. Well, we got it at right in the middle. Okay. Polinzic, uh, they're saying 250 to 275. Well, we got Polinzic too low, according to them. So I guess Polinzic is going to, they think it's going to grow faster. Uh, and obviously they have more information than we do, but they did lower their guidance, if you noticed. They went from 280 to 310. I said, you know, it's going to be more like 250 to 275, which tells you something. So maybe the fact that we're below even that 250 number, maybe we're right. So I'm going to leave it there. Screw it. All right, Naglazyme, uh, they're saying 415 to 450. We're kind of at the upper end of that. And then finally, Vimazim, 686. We're kind of right in the middle of what they're saying. So we're, we're about right here. The total revenues we're saying will be 2.025 billion, which is a little shy than what, what they're saying. Uh, but I have to, I've yet to include Aldurazyme. So let me include Aldurazyme, and then I think we'll be in the right place. So Aldurazyme on average has been 28 a quarter. Aldurazyme, if you know the product, is a really old product. So I don't see any reason why we can't just take the average of the last eight quarters or so and just do it there. So now total revenue is two point, roughly one billion, which is almost exactly in the middle of what they've guided to. And I didn't look at the guidance before I forecasted that. Now I do have uh, half the year already done, so it isn't too hard to forecast. Now I have to forecast margins. So margins have been around 77 for a while. I think their new product, um, uh, Voxogo, is pretty high margin. So I'm going to forecast maybe 78% margins. Um, and um, we'll see how that goes. The OPEX almost doesn't matter what we forecast because, again, this is not a rational spending company. They're just kind of spending to grow, and um, I'm not sure it makes a difference. Although I'd be kind of curious what the SGNA year over year is. So let's take a look at that. The R&D is kind of unpredictable. That's up to them how much they're investing. I don't even like to look at R&D as a cost, to be honest, for drug companies because ultimately if they play their cards right, I want them to spend money in R&D. Um, so let me say, it's not really a cost center if you ask me. So let's just say it's gonna grow 5% um, year over year for SG&A. Oh, by the way, if you look at the revenue growth that we're forecasting, it's gonna be pretty pretty big. And I think that's partially because in Q3, they had some weird one-time low revenue in a couple of products in the, uh, I remember when this quarter happened actually. Uh, there's a lot of controversy as to whether or not it was permanent or a one-time issue. So I'm just going to do a little of this, a little of that. And again, I put all these models on my GitHub. So if you go to github.com uh, forward slash Martin Shkreli, you can download all these. Uh, and I'll be uploading this one real shortly, so you'll be able to get it. Um, if you haven't used GitHub, um, you probably have heard of it. it. It's for computer science people, programmers. But non-programmers can use it too. Um, it's really good for versioning and file control and stuff like that. So um, if you haven't incorporated GitHub into your life, uh, you might want to, you might not want to, but regardless, it's a pretty neat tool. So anyway, we're now starting to build the annual forecasts. This is the pivotal part because one quarter here or there, it doesn't matter that much, but the years matter a lot. Um, and the years are as, as sort of how we value the company, right? How many years of cash flow can we expect from each each year is the basis for basically all finance. Um, if you ever took a finance course in, or an investing course, that's sort of all you worry about is how do you discount cash flows for the whole year. So we only have two years to go on. Um, we have 2021 and 2022. 2022, <laughs> 2022 is a forecasted year, so it's not even a year that we have to go on in a sense because some of it is just our forecast. Um, and maybe if I had more time, I'd add uh, 2020 um, and the other years. And maybe I will. We'll see. But for now, we've got 2021 and 2022. All right. So it looks like revenue grew for them modestly. Maybe that's 10%. What do you guys think? 12%, 13% for uh, 2022. Now the question is, will it grow uh, 
oops, for for uh, 2023, and that's the hardest question. And you really got to think hard about about that. Um, let's get the 2020 numbers just so we have some context. And that'll only take a second because we'll just hop down to, um, yeah, we'll hop down here. So for 2020, Vimism did 544.4. Uh, Naglazyme actually went down for 2021 from 2020. Um, do I, okay, Kuvan went down. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Kuvan went generic, so Kuvan kind of fell off a cliff. But Kuvan is the only pill or small molecule these guys were selling, so you're not going to see another fall off the cliff moment for, for Biomarin anytime soon. For Nura, and you can see they have like a handful of small products. Obviously, um, Vimizim is starting to get up there in terms of its size. Um, but uh, it's really just a bunch of small products, which is kind of a nice place to be from a generics perspective. You know, these drugs are too small for to really attract a lot of competition, which is kind of like a nice strategic benefit of being in the business they're in. All right. So 1.8 billion in product sales. You can see if you think about like how has revenue grown over the years, it's been kind of tepid, right? If you look at even with them launching a few new products, it's kind of the word sad comes to mind. I don't know if that, that's the right word, um, but it's a little disappointing maybe um, that, you know, they've launched a couple of really nice new products. And at the end of the day, you can see revenue growth really tepid. 1.86 to 1.85 to 2.1 billion, really kind of not that great um, of revenue growth. Um, so pretty disappointing if you ask me. I'm sure the company has hoped for more, but the genericization of Kuban probably didn't help them very much. So anyway, let's keep keep doing this and we'll get to a fair value number fairly soon. Uh, and again, it's not gonna be perfect, but um, it'll give us a, a decent guess for what Biomarin is worth. We'll do one more year just so we get the benefit of history a little bit of how these assets have been performing, which sometimes will tell you how the future is coming, and of course, sometimes it won't. Um, oftentimes, it won't, in fact. So, let's see 191, 698. All right, let's get one more year down. So, we're going to go to their 2020 report. Should be here somewhere. right here cool all right so this is vimism in 2019 interestingly was basically flat right with 2020 and then it started picking up again in 2021 and picking up again in 2022 and sometimes those are price increases so we actually have to see if there's any new volume for vimism or if they're just raising the price of vimism every year which as you know i don't think is such a bad idea well, that's just me. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is really hard to tell. Like, what will the the, for, the future of Vimism look like? Because they grew, they were flat in 2020, but then they started growing again, which is a little weird, right? Um, so I don't know. All right, 374.3. So Naglazyme has kind of still been growing, if you think about it. I mean, this isn't great growth, but it's it's a slow grower. And again, that's really important for us when we have to think about, well, what's gonna what's this asset going to do in the long run? Um, that's still really important. So Kuvan, I think, is going to be the easiest to forecast. It's just going to sort of fade into nothingness. That's typically what happens with these kinds of products. Um, and now you can see a little bit healthier growth, right? 1.6, 1.8, sort of over two years, and then 2 billion. So a little, little bit healthier uh, as we zoom back. Kind of very steady growth. And I've always liked Biomarin as a company, as an investment. Um, again, I think the progress has been a little slower than maybe they would have liked and most shareholders would have liked, but it's a really solid company. Some pe sometimes people would ask me, like, what company would I buy and put away for a really long time? And I often would say Biomarin because it's just a really well-run company that makes great products and is one of the few rare disease kind of leaders. Again, they haven't been 
like a tremendous stock or anything, but in the long run, it's really safe. That's the one thing I like about Biomarin. It's so safe. Like you, these drugs are not going anywhere anytime soon. They're like really critical medicines for people, uh, really important, and they obviously um, are going to come out with more of them over time. So anyway, what do we do from here? Well, let's do the same thing we did with the quarters. We see royalties are sort of probably going to they're growing a little bit, I guess, but I'm going to say just conservatively that they stay at the 2022 level forever. Uh, Kuvan is going to be easy to forecast. And again, with this kind of forecast, our precision doesn't matter that much. Uh, it's the growers that matter a little bit more. So we're just going to grow, uh, forecast it growing, going down 90 by, by 10%. So 90% of the last year, every year from here on out, which, you know, is probably not going to be a perfect forecast, but it doesn't matter that much how far we're off because it's not going to make much of a difference. So now it's a lot harder. We're going to have to think about maybe these mature products first. So if we look at Aldurazyme, you can see it's sort of been flattish, maybe 5% growth. So I'm just going to put it at 3% growth just to be conservative. And then for um, Naglazyme, which is their second most mature product, it looks like that's probably a similar, maybe 4% is, is sort of similar. All right, so now we, we're going to get into much more challenging issues here because we have to think about, well, what does Vimazim look like and what does uh, uh, Palinzic look like? So for Vimazim, it looks like it's still growing a little bit. Um, I think it might top out around 800, but I'm not sure. So, you know, this forecast is a little bit of like a high single digits going down to a, a, a low single digits or mid single digits. So kind of just my experience in pharma tells me that. It could grow faster than that. It's definitely not going to shrink. Um, so we'll try for pal Palinzic now. So this is really tricky. This could become a 400 or $500 million product. It's still fairly brand new. I mean, it's only three or four, maybe five years old. So it's really hard to tell what Palinzic is going to do. Um, Palinzic is a drug you take, I think, on top of Kuban, or maybe if you can't take Kuban. So it's for the same disease, PKU, phenylketonuria, um, or however you pronounce it. I don't know. That's a really tricky one. So we're going to put a placeholder number in there just to sort of see. All right. Bernura seems like it's slowing, and I think there's going to be competition for Bernura at some point. So it's probably not done growing since it's for a fairly new product, but I'm just going to sort of shave off it being too much of a grower. All right. Vox, Vox Zogo is the real tricky one. That one's going to be probably a really big grower. So. My guess is, let's see, I'm going to hand code some of these numbers. This could be one of Biomarin's biggest products by far. But I'm still going to be a little bit conservative. Try it like that. All right, so you can see just with the product portfolio, we have them going to 3 billion in revenue, just with the existing products. We're not even including any pipeline products yet. So what's the revenue growth for that look like. Um, sort of like teens for another year and then high single, mid single digits for the rest of forever, which sounds right, about right. Um, that's without any new products. That's going to be the hard part. What are the new products and what are they going to sell? And that's the big controversy for Biomarin. And we're going to go into that in one second. We're doing a real fast, quick and dirty model here. Um, Taxes. I'm going to start having them pay taxes. Um, pay 20% tax rate over time. All right. So R and D. I'm going to have them grow. I'm not going to exclude R and D. I'm going to have um, SGNA grow by around 4%. All right. So you can see that they've become profitable in the, under my model, and they'll start making around a billion dollars a year, which um, is a lot. And let's look at um, the discount rate, because they don't make any money right now. So let's put an 8% discount rate, and I'll talk to you about why we're doing that in a second. At maturity, let's say the cash flows fall 1% a year. So they're 99% of the last year. We'll put that out going into infinity. After a while, it doesn't matter anymore. So now we'll do a net present value. All right, and we're just going to take all of 2023, and we get $13 billion. Well, that's not good news if you're a Biomarin shareholder, right? 
because the stock is trading for, as we talked about earlier, around $17 billion. So what does that mean? The stock is at 90 and maybe it should be at 70 according to our math, right? So we would pass on this one possibly, but we don't know what Valrox is worth, right? If Valrox, uh, which we talked about earlier, if that's gonna be a huge medicine, then everything changes. Uh, if Valrox is not gonna be a medicine at all, well, these aren't worth very much because they're very early in the development pipeline. So there's sort of three key questions, right? First, how big can uh, Voxogo get? 400 million? 600 million? 800 million? Two, what will Valrox do? Zero? 500 million? 1 billion? What, and third is, what is the base business growth, if any? And this is probably a less important question, and maybe a sub-question is, is the rest of the pipeline worth anything? Now, what's interesting is you're going to have a lot of permutations of these four things, right? So if you have four things, and the first one has three options, the next one has sort of three options, the second one maybe has two options, and the second one has maybe two options, you have 36 combinations of possibilities, right? So... Um, we put net cash in there. Uh, so we also, yeah, did not, well, let's try this. We made one little uh, omission, so let's add that omission since we can put in sort of interest growth from existing cash. So that's sort of man the management question. Can management do anything with this cash? Let's assume they, they earn 1% in their cash, which isn't very much, especially in this interest rate environment. Maybe we should assume something better than that. Call it 2%. All right, so this, the shares are still close to fairly valued. So 77 instead of 90. So it's a little bit off. Um, we could even calculate how far off that is. it's 14% off. So pretty much within an error margin, I would say Biomarin is fairly valued. But again, we don't know the answer to those questions. And the answer to those four questions will give us 36 potential outcomes. Really though, the first two questions are what are important. So those two questions will give us really just nine potential outcomes. And we could actually do a nine by nine matrix if we wanted to, which is a little silly, but we could try it. We could do a nine by nine matrix of what happens in each scenario. So we can do uh, over here, we could do val, and that's, um, it could be zero, a billion, or 500 million. And we can do going down, um, we can do a Voxogo, right? And that's going to be either 400, 600, or 800. So depending on those um, outcomes, we kind of get three different pieces. And what's nice is that you notice I haven't even looked at any clinical data. I haven't looked at anything. So I haven't even thought about what are the probabilities of these things happening, which is really important. But I've just said, you know, forget the probabilities. What what happens if to the stock, if this happens? All right, so we're gonna put a Valrox uh, thing in here. And let's just assume, as I said, that Valrox is just a zero. That's the easiest forecast. Uh, Valrox will never get FDA approval. And we have, Voxogo kind of going to 700 million. So let me tweak it a little just so it lands at 600. All right, so 600 by 2030 and the valuation is $75. All right, so let's say Voxogo um, doesn't quite make it that far. It only goes up to say 400. Um, then we got $68. Okay, and now let's have it sort of do even better than what we thought. Have it get up to 800 million and we get $81. All right, so that's all the options for Voxogo. Now let's have Valrox get up to 500 million. So this is sort of a niche product really uh, severe hemophiliacs maybe start to use it. Um, 
FDA warnings, maybe it gives you cancer, who knows, um, which I think is a, one of the things that's happening there. But that's, that's sort of it. All right, so in that case, um, we've got a stock that's worth $99. So we're including that Valrox uh, or Voxogo still does 800. So that's $99 a share. Not much upside uh, from where it's at, but certainly better than the first column. And then let's do it for if um, uh, Valrox gets over a billion, which means it's kind of a popular product, but not like super popular because there's a lot of people with hemophilia. Um, but let's just assume that that's what, that's what happens. Now we get 117. And some people, if you're a big biomarin bull, you might say, well, why not do 2 billion or 3 billion? Well, yeah, you could. You certainly could. Um, let's just try that for, as they say, giggles. All right, so with uh, 2 billion, they would do, it would be $154 a share. That'd be a nice upside, right? All right, and you can see that um, it looks like you lose $6 a share, right, for every 200 million, and you lose $7 a share for that 200 million. So we could just do, be really lazy, and just do that. <laughs> and then be really lazy and just do that. All right, so those are the options for Biomarin. It could be anywhere from 68, if Valrox isn't so great, um, I'm sorry, if Valrox it completely is a zero and Voxogo doesn't sell that great, it's at 68. And 68 is, you know, a pretty good discount from where it's at now, but that would be kind of the worst case scenario, I would say, because um, uh, Voxogo is already quite on its way to, to doing at least 400. Um, so that's only a 24% loss. So that's, that's pretty modest loss for kind of a worst case scenario. And that's why I like kind of like Biomarin stock, right? Because you have that safety. Now, in a more, um, you can say, you can call this delta, I guess, from the current stock price, right? And you could just do that, right? So you can lose 24%, maybe in the worst case scenario. Only a couple of these are even red at all, right? Like most of these are are actually kind of kind of good. So. The only upside, though, really comes if, if uh, Valrox sells a lot. 